Thank you everyone for coming to our virtual event tonight. I'm Sarah Hoffman, the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement at the Kelly School of Business. Um, and we are so excited to be partnering with alum Bill Miller at his J. Carver Distillery out in, I'm gonna say it wrong. It's not the Twin Cities, it's Winokia. Wakunia. Minnesota. <laughs> so thank you all for showing up. Um, and Bill and Gina, I'm gonna, you guys can take it away. Okay, hello everybody, um, fellow Hoosiers. Uh, anybody else that's with us tonight, if you're not a Hoosier, you're welcome to be here too. My name is Bill Miller. Uh, I'm joining you from the cocktail room uh, of the J. Carver Distillery in Wakunia, Minnesota, which is a small town about 30 miles southwest of Minneapolis. I'm one of the founders of the distillery, which was founded in 2012. And with me tonight is one of my business partners and another founder, Gina Holman. Um, if we're entertaining enough, you're gonna be with us for the next 50 or 60 minutes. Gina's gonna begin by briefly talking about Jay Carver and who we are. Then she is going to show you how to make a couple of cocktails with one of our best selling products. Um, I hope you have the ingredients for those products on hand. Uh, if you don't, watch what she does anyway, in case you decide you wanna do it, but get something else to drink because when she's done doing those two demonstrations, I'm gonna speak about my experiences at IU and uh, my career and starting up this distillery. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to drink for that, I think, because this will take a little while. And then at the very end of that, we'll have a Q and A. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Um, following that, Gina's gonna give you a whirlwind tour of the distillery itself, um, which is pretty cool because we are one of the bigger, better distilleries around. Um, and then we're hoping that you're intrigued enough that you come visit us after all this, all this world changes back to normal um, and visit us out here in Waconia. And maybe you will be sipping an old fashioned with the correct logo on your ice cube like I do here. <laughs> Sarah, put up the picture. Um, and with that, let me Thanks, Sarah Hoffman and the Kelly School of Business for the opportunity to talk to you all tonight. Um, and let me introduce Gina Holman, the multi-talented co-founder of Jake Carver. Gina has more than 30 years of experience uh, with restaurants and liquor stores, and she's also a certified instructor of sommeliers. And now she's a distiller as well. So I'm gonna exit for a moment and hand it off to Gina. Hi, everybody. So I'm so honored to be with you this evening. As Bill said, we're here at Jay Carver Distillery. We're very proud of this distillery. What we are known as is a micro distillery. It's called a grain to glass distillery, which means that we make everything from scratch here on site. So for those of you that love going to breweries and brewery tours, the distillery would be that next step. So we work with local farmers, and we have a wide variety of products. Over the last six and a half years, we've actually created about 25 different products, two different vodkas from scratch, four different gins. We've got two beautiful different bourbons and rye, apple brandy, grape brandy, some really lovely liqueurs. And then we've just launched that we started creating about five years ago, single malt whiskey. So it's been an amazing journey. We're very proud of all of the collaborations with local restaurants, retailers, our local farmers. So we're really excited that you're here this evening. What we do love is crafting some delicious cocktails. So I'm gonna spend about five minutes with you. And what you may have with you is our very beautiful Jay Carver barrel gin. This is the darling of a lot of mixologists in the cities. And the reason that this is an amber, beautiful amber colored gin is because we finish off the gin in beautiful barrels that when we do that little whirlwind mini tour, you'll see our back barrel room. And so what's great about this product that you'll see available at many liquor stores across the state is any place that gin goes, it works. And then we call this our whiskey lovers gin. So any place that you would put whiskey, it works well. So 
What we are going to craft right now with our barrel gin is the ingredients that Sarah had sent to all of you. If you have lemon juice and the ginger simple syrup, what we're gonna do is get started making the bee's knees. So if you get your shaker, what we are, we have lots of fun here. And one thing that we do say about rules is we measure cocktails. And why do we measure cocktails precisely is when you fall in love with it, we want you to be able to make it that way time and time again. So you're gonna take two ounces of this delightful Jake Harbor barrel gin. And for those of you that say that you don't love gin, you taste this gin and we will turn you into a barrel gin lover. What we're also very proud of is our fresh ingredients. So you're gonna take three fourths of an ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice. And what we do here is put that in with the barrel gin, three fourths of an ounce of the freshly squeezed lemon juice. And what's really fun about simple syrups, here's the ginger simple syrup that I sent the recipe for you. When we're balancing cocktails, it's all about proportions. So two ounces of the barrel gin is going to be balanced out by equal proportions of the lemon juice and then this gorgeous ginger simple syrup. So we're going to take three fourths of an ounce of the ginger simple syrup and then an ingredient which super important, ice. All these beautiful crystal clear ice cubes. Our dear friend, Eric Eastman of Minnesota Pure Ice. Think of ice like an ingredient. When, when I'm teaching cocktail classes, what I say is, if you can't see through your ice and it smells like green beans, we don't want green beans in your cocktail, right? So we want really beautiful ice as a lovely ingredient. And then we are going to shake. Now, the reason that we're shaking vigorously for about 15 to 20 seconds is because we want to chill down this cocktail perfectly. We also have the ice that's adding as a dilution. So we're going to shake vigorously for about 15, 20 seconds. And if you have shakers like I do, these metal shakers, and you hear that ice, you can tell it's good ice. What happens is when you can feel the stainless steel shaker cold to your hand, and when we can see a line going through, you know that the cocktail is all ready for you to enjoy. And here's what's wonderful is grab a beautiful, we use stemless martini glasses. You've got your strainer, and then you can strain this gorgeous bee's knees. It's lovely, it's chilled, and look at that. Three simple ingredients and an absolutely divine cocktail. Now I'm gonna to transition to show you how versatile the barrel gin is. We are gonna make an old fashioned, and I know you're saying a barrel gin old fashioned, maybe you've tasted them, maybe you haven't. It is amazing. So with an old fashioned, what we're going to do is I take a cylinder like this if you'd like, otherwise simply, you can add two ounces of the barrel gin into your shot glass. And the simple syrup recipe that you got is so delicious. And you can keep that. What I tell people, see this ball jar? That's the simple syrup. You can seal that up and keep it in your refrigerator up to two to three weeks so that you can make this lovely cocktail anytime. And so then we're gonna take half of an ounce of the simple syrup, pour that into the glass. And then again, so many people are making these fun sphere ice cubes. So here's another concept. We love the sphere because then it melts a little bit more slowly. And then for garnishing, I have my orange peel here. So proportionally, the best old fashioned, I tell people, you don't have to muddle the cherry and the orange. You can really elevate it and make it elegant by making that gorgeous syrup. Two ounces of the barrel gin, half ounce of the simple syrup, and then that gorgeous ice cube. We're gonna finish off the cocktail 
half mooning that orange peel so that the oils dance on top. And then who doesn't love a gorgeous Luxardo cherry to finish off this amazing barrel gin cocktail, barrel gin old fashioned. So there we have it. And I'm just honored to be here. So cheers. Here's Bill. Wow. They really are two of our favorite cocktails in the cocktail room. A lot of people come into the distillery and they say, I don't like gin. Then they drink two of those. We have to make them sit for a while before they can leave. <laughs> um, okay, so hopefully you have one or both of those cocktails in front of you and you're gonna be able to sip them now while I speak. Um, I don't really know how long this is gonna take. I'm guessing 10 to 15 minutes. I was asked to speak about my experiences um, at IU and also about starting up Jay Carver Distillery. I'm happy to talk about both of those, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about my investment career in between, which spanned you know, the 25 years or so between the two others. Um, so starting out with like way back and in, in Indiana University for me, a lot of people chose Indiana University and the Kelly School of Business because they wanted to go to the Kelly School of Business. Um, very well known. I know a lot of people that do that and for good reason. Uh, great product. Um, my initial interest in IU was actually the music school, which in the 70s was, and it might still be ranked about as high as Kelly is in, in the uh, education world. Um, that and combined with the fact that I wanted to get as far away from my parents as I could led me to Bloomington uh, in the fall of 78 to visit the school. And I enrolled as an undergrad, out of state undergrad in uh, 1979. Those were really good times to be at Indiana. Those were Bobby Knight's heyday, Isaiah Thomas, 1981 championship. And in general, a pretty good time uh, to be around. Um, also at the business school, which wasn't even called Kelly yet, the school was filled with really awesome, amazing professors that many credit with the great trajectory that Kelly is on today. Um, they, were, they were on the younger side, they were really well respected and they partied with us. They were really into the school and, uh, and it was a whole lot of fun in those days. Um, the only downside was the economy really stunk back then um, and the job market was really, really tough sort of like it was a few years ago. Uh, now, before, before I go any further, what I wanted to talk about were some of the things that have made me to feel like I'm a very lucky person. Uh, throughout my life and career, I've had intersections with people that have been really good to me, really encouraged me and helped me along my way. Um, I hope some of you have had some of those good experiences too. If not, I think you need to keep your eyes and ears open for them because I still have them. I still have them today, periodically. Um, and I had a couple really important ones when I was at IU. The first one was a woman named Betty Richmond. When I arrived on campus in the fall of 79, I decided to check out the IU Business School and I was terrified by the idea that I had to apply after my sophomore year was done. Uh, and even then I might not get in. And at that time, SPIA wasn't even a backstop. It was just getting built. Um, Betty is Betty Richmond's a person that none of you ever heard of. I'm pretty sure she was a counselor in the business school and she was in charge of something called the honors program. Um, that's Betty circled there. Um, the honors program was a five-year MBA program that existed at that time. It doesn't exist anymore, uh, but I heard about it. And I heard that if you got in the honors program that you could get into the school without having to wait to be a sophomore. So I walked down the hall, went to see if I could meet with uh, Betty and, um, and she happened to be in her office. Now, as an aside, that picture is from my wedding which was from 1982. Uh, my wife and I got married in Bloomington when we were in college. I was 20 years old. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what people did back then. Still married 38 years later. That photo is from the Poplars. Some of you may know the Poplars. That's uh, used to be the Kinsey Institute in Bloomington. 
where Alfred Kinsey did his sex research back in the old days. Um, anyway, I owe Betty Richmond a lot. Um, she did more for me in my life than any teacher or professor or friend ever did. Um, when I walked in, she was happy to see me. And she told me all about the program, asked a lot of questions. And then she picked up her phone because people used regular phones in those days. And she made a phone call and 30 minutes later, a young lady walked in with a big file of all my application stuff for IU from the admissions office, which was over by Kirkwood at that time. She flipped through it and after about an hour of talking, she said, okay, so do you wanna do this or not? And I had no idea. I was like, am I capable of this? You know, am I really, do I really know what I'm getting into? And she said, she said, don't worry about it. I think you're ready. I read your reports. You're way better than most people. I think you ought to do it. So I decided, okay, uh, I'll try it. And she promised me that she'd get me through it and make it happen. Um, so I said, yes. She immediately picked up the phone and got me into every class I needed to transfer into weeks after uh, class sign up and everything started to happen. For the next four or five years, she opened doors, got me into classes, found me tutors when I was struggling in math. Um, and she worked with me to make sure I graduated with honors and high distinction in August of 82, three years later. Uh, so super fortunate that I happened to walk in there that day. And I think about Betty every day because she's my password on all my computers ever since. Um, I hope some of you had somebody like Betty while you were at IU or had somebody that really helped you along there because I had lots of them. Okay, that's Betty. Uh, the second person that really helped me a lot was a professor in uh, the finance department. His name was Bob Klemkowski. He was a finance professor that loved Wall Street and the investment business. Um, and he's still around. I had dinner with him a couple of years ago. Has anybody ever heard of him? I hope so. Um, he's an awesome person. He did a lot of things to get the investment world going, including the Reese Fund, things like that. And he would host daily afternoon gatherings in the corner downstairs at Nick's with all the MBA students who wanted to. I never got to go to those because I was like 19 at the time, um, but I know everybody did it and he really was super encouraging to everybody. He was also the professor that signed up to be my advisor for my honors project, which was an independent study project he had to do to graduate from the honors program. It was his idea. It was, he thought it was a really great idea to do it. I didn't even know what I was getting into when I started. It turned out to take about a thousand hours, but I did a good job on it. And he was able to get that published in about eight different leading finance publications at the time. So it was a real home run uh, for him and I. A year later, I finished my MBA and I quickly discovered that Nobody on Wall Street wanted a 21 year old with no investment experience. I interviewed with every Wall Street firm and got rejected across the board. And I bumped into Bob one day and he said, where are you gonna go to work? And I said, well, I'm gonna go to work in the treasury department at Chrysler in Detroit because that's all I could find. And he said, no, you're not, you're not going there. Give me a minute. And the next day, I got a call from the head of a research department at a major buy side company, had a 30 minute interview, and he offered me a job on the spot. Now, I think about that all the time because who knows where I would have been if I went to bankrupt Chrysler. Um, he denies it, but I know he got me the job. So, all these doors open, all the good things. Now you know why I'm a big fan of IU. Um, I have no doubt that IU is an important part of what set me up for success in a lot of different ways. Uh, and when I first got into the business world, <clears throat> it took me about two weeks to realize that I was better trained and I could run circles around a lot of the people from some of the other schools. Um, and I felt really good about that. It gave me a lot of confidence. In 89, I was really lucky I got a call to move to a bigger buy side firm up here in Minneapolis called American Express Financial Advisors. It was American Express at the time. Um, that was considered like the big leagues 
in the investment world. And even when I got there, um, I found that my training was more than enough. I got several quick promotions and I was running a $5 billion growth business when I was 33 years old. I started to sense that the bull market was ending at that time, back around 95, 96, and I built their hedge fund business. And then that allowed me to leave and start my own hedge fund business, which I think you all know, if you can get to a couple billion dollars in a hedge fund business, that's a really lucrative business. So I've been blessed and lucky the whole way. So hopefully that wasn't too boring. <laughs> it's all about me. I don't like this part of it. Um, but people ask me like, well, how important really was IU to your success? I have no idea, but I know that what really mattered was that I always was confident and I knew I had all the ingredients I needed for any job I was asked to do. Um, so at the crazy age of 44, I retired from my hedge fund and, um, and that was that. But during the time I was there, I hired lots of IU grads and not one of them ever let me down. Um, I could name them all. Some of them maybe are even on this, this program right now. But I hope that each of you feels that way, that you feel like you were trained well, because that's what gives you the confidence to continue to succeed. Okay, enough about me. One last thing though, as, as atypical as my story sounds, and I do get it, I know that things are still happening at IU that are awesome because my son, Daniel, just graduated with his five-year MBA in accounting last year and started at KPMG in Chicago um, a few weeks ago. This is a picture of my son, Daniel, when he was one year old in my basement wearing his IU gear in 1998. Uh, in 2015, he became a direct admit to Kelly, got merit-based scholarships, talked his way into the LLC. This was a spoiled, rotten kid who in high school was always studying for tomorrow's test at midnight tonight. Within weeks of getting to Indiana in Bloomington, he was sending me resumes to review and thinking about things two to three years out. It was just amazing to me. He met with a professor called Pat Hopkins in the accounting department at IU, talked him into the five-year MBA program, sailed through that, <clears throat> even taught some uh, undergrad accounting there, found three internships without my help, um, and this is what he looks like a couple of years ago. Now he's got a beard. Um, okay, a little bit about Jay Carver. In 2010, after about five years on the sidelines, I became bored, needed to do something different. I wasn't afraid to start up another business because I'd already done it a few times before and I knew it was a lot easier than I thought. <clears throat> the only time it's tough is if you're broke. So don't try to start up a new business that's uh, underfunded. Since I had already done the financial services world, I wanted to try a product business that was more challenging and fun. And I thought, what could be more fun than making booze? Um, and my brother had worked at a distillery in New York and that looked like fun. And then I met with Gina, my business partner, to see if it was a good idea to do it in Minnesota. And she said, I think so, uh, hire me. And so I did. And we jumped into the Minnesota micro distillery business together in 2012, $5 million. And two years later in 2014, we opened up, started making gins and whiskeys. And now most of our whiskeys are four to six years old and are really truly delicious. Anything you buy, I know you're gonna like. I am not embarrassed about anything we make. Our most recent product introductions are our single malts that Gina was talking about. If you can find them, you really need to try them. They're called Etiquette and Trifecta. Now the business itself and building it, what I can tell you is this, it's a really tough business. Um, because it was a brand new market that was just opening up in Minnesota at the time, I didn't do a ton of due diligence. I just wanted to be one of the first ones and big. And I assumed that being well-funded and well-experienced would let us succeed. I didn't read my Michael Porter book again before I started it. That was a mistake. Um, turns out to be a tough business because it's not a free business. It's not an open market. A lot of government involvement, a lot of laws, a lot of rules, three tier system doesn't let us touch our customers. We've made smart decisions all along the way and we've built out our brand and done everything right. And we're still just getting going in the business. 
We're profitable, we're growing. Um, you just need to come and visit us, find out how good we are and buy more of our stuff so we can take it to the next level. Thank you for listening to me that long. I hope it wasn't too unbearable. Any questions? Um, And if anyone has any questions, they can throw them in the chat and I can read them out or you can ask for me to unmute you. Um, I have to do that, unfortunately, as a host. Sandra did say that she was in the program at the same time, MBA 1983. Do you have a picture of yourself from back then? A picture of me? Uh, I do, but not with me. Okay, well, maybe we can send one after. Um, yeah, you'd laugh. Big glasses. Big glasses in, in the late 70s, early 80s, like those big, huge ones that were four times bigger than your eyeballs kind of a things. And um, that's what I remember. Really tacky looking clothes. Perfect. We have one other question. What advice do you have for alumni who want to make a career switch but may be hesitant? Um, I think you should be really careful about doing it. I think being hesitant is a good idea. And I'll tell you why. If you're successful and you're probably at a big company and you're doing pretty well, it's always tempting to think the grass is greener. And it's always tempting to think that something else will be more fun and better. And I've had lots of friends that have done it. I've done it a few times. It can be really good sometimes, but it can also be really bad. Make sure whatever you do is something you really, really want to do and that you're not running away for something. Because as I think back in my career, if I had never had a promotion once I got to Minneapolis, I would have made a bundle of money and still been super happy and golfed five days a week because it was so easy to do that job. So I would think about taking my time and doing a lot of research before I made a jump into something else. Great, well, we can always come back to Q and A's maybe after the tour. I'm sure people have a lot of questions about your fancy equipment. Okay, well, that'd be fine. Thank you everybody for, uh, for listening. Thank you, Bill. And Gina, it looks like you're back up. Just okay, hi everybody. All right, so we are going to do a uh, tour, virtual tour. So as we've said, this is Jay Carver Distillery. And when we start walking, so let's go this way. And you don't have a thinking, David? Yeah. There we go. You want me to tip it up a little Yeah, bit? let's go. This. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So this is the Jay Carver Distillery cocktail room. You are uh, as you know, this was the Pontiac car dealership. So the room that we were speaking from was where everybody used to get their oil changed. And so now as we come through here, we actually designed a whole different building that we never built. And oh, there we go, that we never built. And when we saw the Pontiac car dealership um, through lots of vision, this space is where everybody was the showroom floor. And so you can see, as I said before, the fermentation tanks, and our equipment was able to work in this space through many hours of measuring and everything, making sure that everything uh, was able to work well. Behind me, you're gonna see, and we'll scroll up. This is really the only change, the very top of the space. You, know, a little bit more. you see that very top area, that cupola, is the only change that we had to make to the exterior of the building, believe it or not. And that was to house the last eight feet of the vodka still. And through Bill's vision and leadership, when he knew that we were gonna start the distillery, he did go around and as you can see, asks all the tough questions. Um, we are so grateful here with the team that we have built together to ask those really tough questions. So ask them, I, they're amazing to, to think about what it entailed for us to start the distillery. And so a lot of that was building an expert group that had their own gifts and talents 
and it was the equipment and then knowing that we wanted to stick with that green to glass approach. So if you come this way and see that whole education piece, we really, really invite you to visit us for a tour. And what you see here is our passion to work and collaborate with local small businesses. That is so special for us. And as I stated, so our two different vodkas become our four different gins and the mash bills of our two different bourbons and our three different ryes. So when you come and visit, and we hope that you do, you'll see this amazing equipment. So that double column, and David, if you stand up again, you can see what makes it so special is that for us to distill our vodka, it goes through those gorgeous double columns. Then we come over to this space and this is our gorgeous swan neck whiskey still. And this is where all of our whiskey is made. And so when we walk into the back barrel room, what I would state is ask a lot of questions about whiskey for those of you that love, um, you know, spirits, because you see so much of the technique happens here when we're distilling, especially with the fact that we make everything here from scratch on site. So for those of you that love baking, you understand working with those really wonderful fresh ingredients as we do with our local farmers makes the difference with our expertise, the equipment and how we distill. Over here, this is our very fun baby still. We call this our test still and Dan, our distiller just got done polishing it. So very gorgeous. And this is where we do a lot of R&D and a lot of innovation. So whatever we create here, whether it's somebody saying we want, and I love that um, Craig talked about and called out the grappa. So Craig, what's super cool is when we worked with our three local wineries to create grappa, that became the base for our absence. And when Bill was talking about a lot of the liquor laws, there are challenges for us. The challenges also create many opportunities. And so when we were able to make the grappa, that became the base for our very gorgeous everlasting absence. For so those of you that have been down in New Orleans or you love a Sazerac cocktail, we were able to do test batches with grappa and create everlasting absence. Since we're here in Minnesota, uh, we have a lot of people that love Aquavit for that whole Scandinavian side. And so we were very fortunate to be asked in collaboration with the Hewing Hotel to create Aquavit for them. And the base of our Aquavit is from our J. Carver vodka. So very fortunate, very grateful to have this amazing equipment. And now what you'll see is we'll go back and this is the hallway, so you can imagine. We knew that this space would work for us to create the distillery. And so when we walk back here, you'll see that this is where there were 12 lifts for a lot of the mechanics to work on the cars. And this became a place for us to repurpose and turn this into our warehouse. And now as we walk, one of the most special places in the entire distillery is our barrel room. And we are very, very fortunate in Minnesota to have three local cooperages. So when people ask what is a cooperage, that is how we're a distillery and we create um, spirits. A cooper is an artist that makes these gorgeous barrels. And so with all of this gorgeous oak, you can see over the past, and Dave, if you want to span, very grateful to Bill and our partners for just the commitment to the whiskey that is now being produced here with all of our local farmers and definitely the passion that we have collaborating with our coopers. So many different size barrels here. Now that we've got at least six and a half years under our belt of distilling and this gorgeous whiskey being aged, we're so proud of the accolades and the awards that we've been receiving across the country. We're doing really special things here. 
We're not cutting corners and the, the hard work and the muscle is really showing, showing off the fact that we are a team and all of these gorgeous barrels, 30 gallons and 53 gallon barrels have really played a special part in working with local restaurants and retailers across the state. So with that being said, I think we've given you a lot to, to look at. Now, what I've said is amazing what makes bourbon bourbon. And we'll talk about this when we go back into the cocktail room. So, so much is dependent upon the mash bill, the ingredient, right? What makes your cake a cake? What it makes carrot cake, carrot cake, and chocolate cake, chocolate cake. What makes bourbon bourbon is that it has to be majority corn. So at least 51% corn. What makes rye rye? It has to be at least 51% rye. You'll also see in these barrels that gorgeous barrel gin that you enjoyed. That gin is aged in these amazing barrels in our barrel room. We've had apple brandy in all of these barrels that you see behind me along with the portfolio and Island View Brandy. So for those of you that are brandy lovers, we definitely make brandy here also with amazing grains and fruits from the bounty of harvest here in Minnesota. So with that being said, let's head back to the cocktail room. And so when you come visit us, you can see how amazing this building actually did work out for us to be able to facilitate these amazing tours Everything is in one space. And as you come back, yeah, you'll see that we are right back where we started and you get to see this gorgeous cocktail room. And as we're going to, I'll show you one little blip so that you can see that is Jonathan Carver. So there are some beautiful photos on our wall. And with that being said, that was our awesome tour. And then we are right back where we started with any other questions that you may have for Bill. Thank you, Gina. She's really good. Thank you, Gina. Um, if anyone has any questions they would like to ask at this time about the tour, the barrels, Bill, his time at Kelly, um, please feel free to type them in the chat or you can type and ask to be unmuted and I can unmute you as well. I can start us off. Bill, what is your favorite product that you guys make? My favorite product that we make is a whiskey called Runestone Rye. The Runestone, for those of you who don't know, is a rock up in Alexandria that the Vikings put here about 300 years before Columbus came. A lot of people dispute that. I'm a total believer that the Vikings were here. Uh, I believe in the runestone, like seriously. And so I want to name one of our products after runestone. This is 100% rye whiskey. You know, bourbon, everybody knows. Everybody's a bourbon expert these days. Rye whiskey is growing like a weed right now. People are moving on to rye. It's got a lot more spice. This has got a lot of malt. So it's almost like a rye whiskey that's like scotch. It's so easy to drink, it's hard to stop. So this is this is my favorite. Um, I like most of what we have. You know, that's the one thing I've told everybody. Like, if we don't like it, we're not selling it. We've developed about 40 products, about 28 made it to market, and a couple will, will fall off. Great. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Bill? Looks like we have one. Rochelle is on the line. She said, thanks, Bill and Gina. Are you open for business and are you able to sell online or local only? Love the Betty password. Okay. Um, well, we are not open right now. Theoretically, we could be at a limited level. I am being super careful and super cautious uh, with my employees. Most of us are old like me. And uh, not Gene, of course, um, but a lot of us are experienced. And given that we're a destination for people from all over the place, I really feel like that flies in the face of trying to control things. So we're taking our time. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to buy online, but you can go to 
um, South Lindale Liquors, Solovino in St. Paul, and Ace Spirits in Hopkins, and you can buy anything we make online. By law, we are not allowed to do that. Minnesota liquor laws make it really hard for us to do any kind of direct sales whatsoever. But I wish we could, maybe someday. Okay, great. Well, we will get those links to also send to everyone after the event so they can order some if they'd like. Um, another question we have from JW. What new product is coming out in 2021? How many new products do you launch every year? Okay, so that's a really good question because we are introducing next week our very last planned product. When we started, we had 24 products planned, which was like 20 more than most distilleries think about when they're starting up. Um, this product is called Trefecta Whiskey. It's an American single malt whiskey that we, uh, that we will have on the market. I think we're shipping it to our distributor on Monday, should be on shelves by Thursday. It's only about 500 bottles if you really want one. It is by far the best product we've ever made. It is all barley malts. This is like a single malt scotch, but it's in American barrels. Um, it goes along with our other- This one that was so good, that's like empty. <laughs> our other single malt whiskey, which is completely sold out unless you can find a bottle or two. I know there's a couple at the Delano liquor store, but it's pretty much sold out. These are the best products we've ever done. They're our last products. I'm not sure we'll ever do another one. Right now, we're just letting things get older and better. Um, the reason why is we have two different special vodkas. We already have four gins. We have nine whiskeys. We have a lot of stuff. So um, we're pretty much done as far as new, but I can't believe everyone's tried them all. All right, another question we have from Allison. She said, I'd love to know more about what the cocktail creation process is like for your team. How long does it take to come up with the perfect drink? Ah, see, this is why you hire really good people that have experience. I, I love to cook. I love to drink. I do both of those things way too much, but I don't follow recipes. I just love to mess around and play until I like something. That's not a good way to do cocktails. That's why mostly what I do is I drink straight. Um, Gina, who you met earlier, Gina ran a liquor store and a uh, restaurant for many years called uh, the Wyzetta Muni. Many of you probably know what that is, but she also is a trained sommelier. They learn about everything, including spirits. Making a cocktail really is sort of like a little sweet, a little sour, a little acid, a little spirit. There's some standard rules that you use to make a balanced cocktail, but it really takes a palate. It takes somebody who really gets that stuff and she does it. So when we make a cocktail, she does it. Um, the team really does it. That's her bailiwick. Most really good restaurants have one bartender or one mixologist that rocks, that knows how to do that. Um, and you know it when you taste their cocktails. And so you can learn about that. I'm sure there's classes. I February think the most, 3rd. February 3rd. actually February 3rd, we're doing one. If you <laughs> wanted to sign up, Gina does them monthly. Um, but I, I think what Gina said earlier is the one thing that I think most people just don't pay attention to, like stinky ice, lemon juice out of a jar from the grocery store. If you want a good cocktail, you need good quality spirits and good quality ingredients. And since I'm a micro distillery, I'm here to tell you, our stuff is way better than what the big guys make. The big guys are like Budweiser and Miller. They're making stuff that just is inexpensive to make and low cost so they can market it to you. We are making things that are totally born and bred to be flavorful and yummy. I love the shameless plug for your event. Um, oh. Hey, you're a businessman. <laughs> um, Elijah said, have you tried selling in Bloomington at Bloomington businesses or opening a location in Bloomington? I think you'd be a hit with other places like the Tap or Upland. 
Um, you know, we have not tried to sell in Indiana yet. You know, liquor laws are a lot trickier than you think. And our, our main strength is our, our local position in our local market. We decided not to roll out into a lot of other states until we had really ass kicking whiskeys and things that were aged and developed. Um, there's a good chance we will get into, uh, into Indiana, mainly because I've got tons of people there and I married a girl from there. Um, and you know, when I'm in Bloomington, the Uptown Cafe, I give them bottles every time I'm there to just play with, even though the bartenders rotate in C3 or C whatever it is out by um, the uh, mall. I go there a lot and give them some too. Um, I would love to do it. And maybe someday, most of the times I go there with my car full and I hand it out to all my old professors who love to take it for free. If you have any extra bottles, you know, I can tell you where my office is. Well, you might be to dinner in Bloomington next time I'm there. By the way, I don't know if any of you do this or not. I'm sure you're not all opera fans, but if you don't, after you graduate, if you don't go back to Bloomington once a year, just to hang out and go to an opera at the Jacobs School, you're crazy. It's the best show anywhere, best opera school in the world, and it's really inexpensive, and you get to go back to Bloomington. We do it two or three times a year for the last 30 years. It's awesome. A little off topic, but what was your favorite opera at the Jacobs School? Well, actually, last year, they did Gianni Schicchi, Gianni Schicchi is a Puccini opera that hardly ever gets done because it's really three short little operas, Sir Angelica, Gianni Schicchi, and another. And it's got, Google it and listen to O Mio Caro Babino and you will know why, you know the music from it, but it's hardly ever done. And they did it last year. So we went to it twice in a row, two nights in a row last year. That's probably like the highlight because I've been wanting to go since I was like 40. And we finally found somebody doing it. Wonderful. Well, hopefully things will open back up and we'll be able to all enjoy a good opera. I would love that, for sure. Does anyone have any last questions or anything they like to say? Anyone need the ingredients again? We will happily send the ingredients out um, in an email tomorrow. And we will also hopefully be able to send some websites of where you can order J. Carver Distillery online if you would like. Bill, Gina, thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great night. There she is. There she is. Thank hey. you for showing us around your distillery. I hope we were entertaining. And I am not like God's gift to start up businesses, but I've started up several. If you want to learn about cocktails, if you just want to talk about Bloomington or Indiana, if you want to start a company or make a change, you just want to talk to somebody who's done a few... I'm wide open to helping any of you anytime, any way I can. Um, I probably do have a couple of good ideas somewhere up in my head. But come out to Waconia, find my email on our website. Be happy to help anyway. Great. Thanks so much, guys. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great night and enjoy the rest of your drinks. <laughs>